happening tonight in Vancouver. We are certainly discouraging people from going out. Dangerously high temperatures are coming to BC. Streaming hot, record breaking. People are already trying to cool off here in Abbotsford as emergency services prepares for unbearable conditions in the next few days. Is it a total fluke or a sign of things to come? This decade, especially uh, heat waves, droughts, things like that are becoming more frequent. Is the streak of hot weather we're seeing here in BC a sign of climate change? If you're wondering what's safe or what's not, depending on your COVID-19 vaccination status, when you have to wear one of these and be outside, when you can be inside without one, there's some new guidance to help, but it comes with a healthy dose of caution. Breaking news from Langley tonight. This large plume of smoke is a house fire near 216th Street and 48th Avenue. But we're also hearing from people in the area that it's actually two houses side by side that are up in flames right now. This is a look from high above the scene in the News 1130 Air Patrol. We have calls out to the Langley Fire Department. We'll bring you more updates as they become available. We are certainly discouraging people from going out. Extreme heat is coming to British Columbia. Environment Canada has issued a heat warning for a large section of the province that has health and emergency services bracing to respond to some unbearable temperatures. Highs in Metro Vancouver are expected to range between 29 to 38 degrees over the next few days. It'll be even hotter in the Fraser Valley, with parts of the interior seeing temperatures into the 40s. Anywhere exposed across the south you're going to get a little bit more humidity so I would say Abbotsford uh, south to the border and then the farther inland the humidity will go down the higher you go up in elevation out toward hope and beyond the humidity is going to go down but the temperatures they're going to be really high screaming hot record breaking. at Albert Dick Park in Abbotsford the temperature hit 30 degrees by Friday morning yeah, it's better than in the house because we don't all have air conditioning and it's too hot in the house. Well, people are hitting the beach early for a dip into this cool water, but they know that temperatures are rising quickly and their time is limited. I'd stay here all day, but I have brought other people with me. So they tell me that I'm, well, I have to leave here because we've been here since 10. So they tell me I have to leave at about 1.30. At lunchtime, usually we're out of here. This yeah. is the cue, take off the hat time. Yeah, can't yeah. do without a hat. So yeah, I would say two hours for sure. Downtown, you won't see many people on foot. Patios aren't popular out here either. And nearby, a cooling center is opening for the peak hot hours of the day. An initiative from the city, police and Cedar Outreach Society. We're concerned, quite frankly, because these are temperatures that we're not used to. A lot of our homeless go deep into wooded, forested areas where they are under the cover of shade and, and trees, but we know that there's also a transient population. Fraser Health says prepare for extreme heat this weekend, avoid strenuous activity, and stay in a cool area during the day. So more severe signs of heat-related illness might include a loss of consciousness, confusion, very hot temperature, hot dry skin, and if you see someone in those circumstances, that might indicate heat stroke and you want to call 911. The overnight lows, that's the big concern. When it gets down to room temperature or above for the low, and that's only for a brief period around dawn, it just doesn't cool off and it doesn't allow us to cool off and uh, that's when it becomes a little bit dangerous. It's the kind of blistering heat that has people giving up on the beach. Do you have like air conditioning or some tower fans at home you could do to... Oh yeah, definitely, but um, I'm going to be selfish with it and uh, uh, just keep it to myself because uh, it's pretty hot out there. In Abbotsford, Crystal Adaris, City News. The Mission School District has announced schools will be closed on Monday due to the extreme heat. They say they're concerned about not having sufficient air conditioning in record-breaking temperatures. They apologize for any inconvenience they, this may cause and expect schools to reopen on Tuesday. I think this is a, you know, a harbinger of the kind of thing to expect more of the, with time. Uh, you can't ever say a heat wave is 100% climate change because weather happens, right? But that extra 
smidgen of heat on top of what would be a normal heat wave. Uh, I, that's how I like to think of, of a change in climate. As BC grapples with record setting temperatures over the next few days, is this heat wave a one off or a sign of things to come if we don't change? It's pretty clear that this is uh, part of the trend that's been projected and expected. And quite frankly, we are seeing around us, you know, this decade, especially uh, heat waves, Droughts, things like that, are becoming more frequent. We had a big one in uh, 2017. Dr. Stephen Shepard is with the Faculty of Forestry at UBC. He's been studying climate change for years. Uh, there have been some excellent studies, including regional studies uh, for BC and uh, Metro Vancouver, that project uh, that we're going to see three or four degrees extra um, average temperatures, um, particularly in the summer, um, over you know, middle of the century and later in the century. And BC is already up uh, over one degree on average. Um, and we're warming faster than some other parts of the world. What's important to take a look at is the patterns and the repetition. So seeing the same thing three, four, five years in a row, even 10 years in a row, that could actually spell trouble for our world. I don't know if we've had a stretch this long um, where we've had warm temperatures overnight and in the daytime too. We're talking about a four or five day stretch here. We frequently get three, maybe four day stretches with daytime highs in the mid thirties around the area. That's why the records for the Fraser Valley, for example, are in the mid thirties. As for weather news, 1130 meteorologist Michael Coos thinks this is all tied to climate change. We have incredibly extreme highs and extreme lows all the time and we have throughout history. It's when we see a series of these events, that's what signals or indicates that the climate is changing and this just isn't a one-off event, it's a pattern. Is there room for improvement in BC's climate change policies? They're a little slower than we would like, that the scientists would like. It's, you know, we've known about climate change for 20 or 30 years, but BC has been a leader and, uh, many of the communities themselves are taking this very seriously. He says it's important individuals take action. I think they should talk to their community centers, talk to their libraries, talk to their local politicians and find out what programs are going on. How can, what can I join up and do? And, and I think we need a lot more of that. In Vancouver, Rhea Renouf, City News. There are 72 new cases of COVID-19 across the province tonight, and two more people have died from the virus in the last day. 108 people are currently in hospital. 37 of those are in intensive care. 77.6% of all adults in BC have had their first dose, and 26.9% of all adults have had both shots. BC is scheduled to move into phase three of its official restart plan on Thursday, July 1st. More information on that is expected early next week. If you've been vaccinated for COVID-19 with one dose, maybe two, you might be wondering, what does this mean I can do now? When do I have to be outdoors wearing this? And when can I head indoors and take it off? There's some new guidance that can help. This chart from Canada's top doctor looks at if you're fully, partially or unvaccinated and ranks different settings for when it's safe to do away with masks and distancing. Only small outdoor gatherings get the go ahead for everyone, increasing cautions with indoor settings and large groups. The BC doctor who's been on the front lines of promoting vaccinations with this is our shot says general guidance can't make your personal decisions. When it comes to your own life, who you're inviting into your life, who you're inviting into your home, and what your their personal risk factors are, and what your personal risk factors are. There's no, uh, there's no, there are limitations in what general guidance can do. There is a COVID risk calculator online that helps assess specific circumstances. It asks 21 questions. I tried a mostly vaccinated group indoors, talking and eating for an hour, a moderate risk. The same gathering of unvaccinated people. A high risk. I think that's why we have to really look at this not as a all or nothing scenario. There is be cautious, um, invite people in slowly. Um, uh, but when you do, if you're fully vaccinated, uh, it, you can take off the masks if they're fully vaccinated and you both are. With temperatures soaring this weekend, many won't want to be outside, instead, beating the heat by heading indoors. Balancing that with the risk of COVID, which while we're doing great, 
it's not gone. Indoors carries the same risk, whether hot or cold, outside. And even with all the charts, risk calculators, protocols and protections, the COVID-19 risk calculation remains very personal. My second dose was January 31st, and I still haven't gone inside my parents' house. For City News in Victoria, I'm News 1130's Lisa Yuzda. If we just keep allowing it to happen, we continue to perpetuate misogyny and sexism. The owner of several Metro Vancouver restaurants and pubs has removed the name of a cocktail from its menus after a customer complained saying the name was offensive to women. Just in time for the weekend, gas prices are nearing record-breaking territory. The price for a litre of regular sits at $1.70.9 at a lot of stations across Metro Vancouver right now. But we are hearing there are a few places that have lower prices. The all-time record price for this region is $1.72.9. And that was set back in May of 2019. Walk-on passengers using BC Ferries can now ensure they've got a spot on a boat. BC Ferries will now take reservations for foot passengers for trips from Tawasin, Swartz Bay, Duke Point, Horseshoe Bay and Departure Bay. You can book online and then redeem your ticket at a self-serve kiosk or ticket agent. For now, BC Ferries is limiting the number of reservations so it doesn't mean the trip is sold out if there's no walk-on tickets available. WestJet is bringing back more pre-COVID flights, both within to and to and from BC. As travel restrictions are relaxed, the airline says it's ready for people who are eager to fly once again. That includes restarting eight routes across Western Canada and into Ontario that had been paused during the pandemic and starting 10 new ones by July 5th. Within BC, it's Vancouver Cranbrook. Flights are resuming as of today, as are flights from Abbotsford to Prince George. We are there to be a partner in whatever is needed. There is not the commitment to action behind the words. Justin Trudeau under increasing pressure to launch an independent investigation into residential schools. I thought that it wasn't right and I was surprised and shocked. You'll no longer find a cocktail on the menus of several Metro Vancouver pubs after a customer found the name offensive to women. While redheaded slut is a popular American drink made with Jägermeister, peach flavored schnapps and cranberry juice. When Angela Wolf saw it listed on the menu of a Port Moody pub on Father's Day, she was taken aback name of this derogatory drink is, um, you know, makes it seem as though women are less than men. It's, you know, misogynistic and it's sexist. It's both of those. Wolf complained on the Facebook page of the pub Livelihood, which is owned by Joseph Richard Group. When News 1130 reached out to the company, it quickly pulled the drink, as well as others that could potentially offend, off the menus at nine of its restaurants, including Livelihood, and apologized. We all feel badly if anybody is offended in coming to any of our locations. We want people to feel welcome and included. When it comes to the shot list, it was also up for discussion and something that was was uh, going to be put on an agenda to be discussed. And this now being brought to our attention that it actually has offended somebody uh, is very, um, well, it's disappointing. While Wolf's Facebook complaint drew comments from some who suggested the name is just a name, she argues that mentality is how sexism and misogyny work. People just brush it off as no big deal. But in fact, if we just keep allowing it to happen, we continue to perpetuate misogyny and sexism. And so the only way to get rid of it is to call it out and fix it. Mona Gleason, an educational studies professor at UBC, whose expertise includes the history of gender, agrees, saying the name of things matter as they connect to the way we think about people. It, it could be considered particularly problematic when these kind of um, oh, almost joke, jokey kind of names for drinks uh, really tap into something that's a little bit more serious, right? Which is um, gender inequalities between men and women, um, 
you know, the uh, relationship between alcohol and, uh, you know, um, sexual abuse. For City News in Vancouver, I'm News 1130's Monica Gould. We are there to be a partner in whatever is needed to find the full truth and ensure reconciliation is possible. Justin Trudeau says his government is here for Indigenous people and committed to unearthing the truth of residential schools, but he won't commit to an independent investigation with subpoena power. We will continue to be there to support the communities in their needs as they grieve, as they work through this, as they get the understanding and knowledge they need in order to heal. We will keep putting Indigenous peoples and their wishes at the centre of everything we do. Literally, out of one side of his mouth, we're here for you. Out of the other side of his mouth, they're fighting First Nations residential school survivors in court not wanting to release documents. How is that there for us? Mi'kmaq scholar and attorney Pam Palmiter says she's not impressed with vague promises of support. After the Kamloops discovery of 215 unmarked graves, United Nations observers called for an independent investigation into residential schools, a call repeated by former Senator Murray Sinclair. Sinclair, who chaired the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, says an investigation must have the legal power to subpoena documents the Canadian government or Catholic Church have not shared. The more we wait on this, debate on this, see if, oh, maybe we have to wait until after the election, or maybe we have to wait until someone convenes, documents could be destroyed as we're speaking. So the legal proceedings need to start ASAP. Palmiter believes the Boston sex abuse scandal showed the Catholic Church is not afraid to hide or even destroy documentary evidence. The missionary of Oblates of Mary Immaculate now says it's prepared to release residential school records, but that order only operated 48 of 130 residential schools, including those at Kamloops and Cowessis. Palmiter says if Canadians are serious about truth and reconciliation, they should make it a ballot box issue. Every single political party that runs in this next federal election better have a detailed, time-costed-out plan for how they're going to deal with all of these issues um, and not just say, well, this is a plan for the middle class or this is a plan for industry or, you know, if, they, if everything isn't centered on Indigenous peoples this election, then that is not the party for us. In Ottawa, Shaoli Lee, City News. Some breaking news for you happening right now. A large group of people currently moving very slowly over the northbound lanes of the Camby Bridge, heading into downtown. No traffic is getting by at this moment through the southbound lanes, though the southbound lanes remain clear. We'll keep an eye on the situation, of course, and give you more information as it becomes available. Feeling a little lonely? Well, how about a little spark of joy from a stranger? A unique project out of New Westminster is asking the community to go back to the often forgotten art of letter writing. I'm going to leave my letter behind and hopefully there will be a letter for me to take with me. Monique Stanley Davy is the artist behind the project. All you have to do is put pen to paper and write whatever comes to you. Then you seal it in an envelope and exchange it at the mailboxes located along the Quayside boardwalk for another one written by a stranger. Davy says the idea came out of her desire to find connection during the pandemic. Actually relocated to New Westminster from Ontario. Um, I came to study creative writing and kind of go on a writing hiatus. However, with the pandemic, I became extremely isolated and so I wanted to create a platform where other people can express and connect with other people in the community through writing. It's just a really cute way to talk to strangers, like even not during COVID times, you know? That's nice. Yeah, good idea. I think it's a great way to bring back communication and not by being together. I think, you know, COVID has taught us that we can still have relationships by being apart. And, uh, Letter writing is something that is a skill. Davy has even set up an Instagram page for people to share the letters they've received via the hashtag NW Letter Exchange. I wrote the first set of letters so that way the community had letters to exchange and I also bring down letters every so often when I want to share with the community. People are also encouraged to get creative with the project and add homemade crafts to their letters as well. The mailboxes were put up earlier this month and the city says it's planning to keep the exchange going permanently. It's been honestly really 
good. My goal was to impact at least one person, and I have exceeded that goal, so I'm very thankful. In New Westminster, Ashley Burr, City News. This week in science, we're back here at the Space Center talking about Beetlejuice, not the Tim Burton movie from the 80s, The Star. It's the reddish looking shoulder of the constellation Orion. It's the 10th brightest star in the night sky, and it is destined to explode. Beetlejuice's supernova is going to happen rather soon, in the cosmic sense of time anyway. When it does happen, you won't need a telescope to watch. It would last several weeks and be as bright as the full moon even during the day. And there's been speculation that this supernova was imminent. In late 2019, Beetlejuice started to become noticeably dimmer, a possible sign that the red supergiant had run out of fuel and was starting to collapse in on itself. This event was dubbed the Great Dimming. In the span of just a couple of months, Beetlejuice lost about two-thirds of its normal luminosity, making it more like the 21st brightest star in the sky. Astronomers naturally were curious about why this was happening, so they started to watch it using the European Southern Observatory's Very Large Telescope. That's in Chile. What they discovered was the star's light loss was not uniform. Instead, it was concentrated in its southern hemisphere. And they've now concluded that Betelgeuse let off a clump of gas about a year before the Great Dimming. That gas was able to condense into dust because of a regular spell of cooler weather in the star's southern region. And it's that dust which was blocking a lot of the light from reaching Earth temporarily. So no explosion. In fact, one might not happen for another 100,000 years. We don't actually know. This new research published in the journal Nature says it's possible Betelgeuse will blow up without giving off many warning signs first. But don't worry, it's some 700 light years away from here, so we're well outside the blast zone. With this week in science on City News, I'm News 1130's Curtis Doring. A quick update on the march that has blocked the northbound lanes of the Camby Bridge. According to social media, it is a Black Lives Matter march, and they are headed to Emory Barnes Park. Vancouver's News is always available on the radio with News 1130 or online anytime at citynews1130.com. The next edition of City News is tonight at 11. Thanks for watching and have a great night.